welcome to Merton College Chapel for this service of choral evensong on the fifth Sunday after Easter. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Dearly beloved, the scripture moveth us in sundry places to acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and wickedness, and that we should not dissemble nor cloak them before the face of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, but confess them with an humble, lowly, penitent, and obedient heart, to the end that we may obtain forgiveness of the same by his infinite goodness and mercy. And although we ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before God, yet ought we most chiefly so to do when we assemble and meet together to render thanks for the great benefits that we have received at his hands, to set forth his most worthy praise, to hear his most holy word, and to ask those things which are requisite and necessary as well for the body as the soul. Wherefore, I pray and beseech you, as many as are here present, to accompany me with a pure heart and humble voice unto the throne of the heavenly grace, saying with me. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind, in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desireth not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, and has given power and commandments to his ministers to declare and pronounce to his people being penitent the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardoneth and absolveth all them that truly repent and unfeignedly believe his gospel. Wherefore, let us beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> o Lord, open thou our lips.
psalm set for this evening is 87, for which we sit. The first lesson is written in the book of Genesis, chapter 9. God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear and dread of you shall rest on every animal of the earth, and on every bird of the air, on everything that creeps on the ground, and on all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you, and just as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. Only you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. For your own lifeblood, I will surely require a reckoning. From every animal, I will require it, and from human beings, each one for the blood of another, I will require a reckoning for human life. Whoever sheds the blood of a human, by a human shall that person's blood be shed. For in his own image, God made man humankind. And you, be fruitful and multiply. Abound on the earth and multiply in it. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you. And with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth 
and the bow is seen in the clouds. I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Here ends the first lesson.
The second lesson is written in the Gospel according to John, chapter 14. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned, I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me, because I live. You also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. Here ends the second lesson.
I believe in God, the Father Almighty. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and
Details of services during this coming week are to be found on page 16 in today's Order of Service booklet. Perhaps I might just draw your attention in particular to the services on Ascension Day this Thursday, a service at the top of the tower at 12 o'clock and admission to the tower is from 11.30 and then a Eucharist here in the evening at 6.00. As you leave the chapel today and proceed into the anti-chapel, there will be an opportunity to contribute to a retiring collection for the work of shelter, and we're invited to give as generously as we feel able to. After the service, drinks will be served on Cherry Tree Lawn. Please feel that that invitation is to you personally. Cherry Tree Lawn is just outside the main entrance to the chapel. It's a particular pleasure to welcome the Right Reverend Christopher Lowson, formerly Bishop of Lincoln, as our preacher this evening, and there'll be an opportunity to speak to him at drinks after the service. The anthem is Tribue Domine, the words are of unknown origin. The music is by William Byrd.
Let us pray. As Noah reminds us, in his own image, God made humankind. Let us therefore give thanks for our common dignity as creatures bearing God's own image. And let us pray for all lives where that dignity is obscured by violence, prejudice or injustice this night, longing for peace for all. Almighty God, in Christ you reveal the glory of your image in the midst of our fragile humanity. Help us to grow into the knowledge of our true worth and to draw out the dignity of those around us with acts of love and service and keep alive the flame of your light in every human heart overwhelmed by suffering this night to the glory of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Christ promises his disciples, I will not leave you. Gathered in this space, let us remember that we are never alone, and so let us lift up with thanksgiving those good things we have received today, and let us pass into God's hands for safekeeping anything we have left unfinished or undone, for healing anything which has troubled us, and for forgiveness anything we wish we had done differently, trusting in the love which always already waits for us here. Almighty God, in Christ's death and resurrection, you reveal that no sorrow, sin or guilt can separate us from the joy of your ever-expanding compassionate heart. Hold us secure in the knowledge of your love this night. Comfort the sick, hold the lonely, embrace the guilty, and bring us safely to the tenderness of the new dawn, through the Lord of all gentleness, Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> So in the silence, we hold before God the prayers on our own hearts tonight. We commend ourselves, one another, and all for whom we have prayed into God's loving care in the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. We now stand to sing our hymn, Now the Green Blade Riseth.
Please be seated. I'm glad to be with you at Merton College this evening. I'm really grateful for the graceful and generous welcome I've received from the community, not least the musical welcome with lots of music by William Bird, whom you may know was Director of Music, Master of Choristers, Organist at Lincoln Cathedral for some years. So it's good to hear some Bird this evening. This is my first visit to the college, though I'm not new to Oxford. As Bishop of Lincoln for 10 years, I paid many visits to Lincoln and Brasenose Colleges as their visitor. But this isn't my first encounter with the Merton community, because for several years, students from Merton would come on retreat to Lincoln with Simon Jones, and I would always find an hour to entertain them for a glass of wine and a conversation. I hope you can reciprocate with me this evening. May I speak to you in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus said <clears throat> in this evening's second lesson, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. In our pattern of worship, we are now moving towards the end of the Easter season. Next Thursday is Ascension Day, and by then we shall have been celebrating the resurrection of Jesus for 40 days. These 40 days being the period that Jesus appeared to his disciples in his risen form after the resurrection and before he ascended into heaven. The earthly Jesus came as the Messiah in the great tradition of Judaism. Even though the Jews are sometimes characterized in the Gospels as rejecting Jesus, Jesus lived in the context of the Jewish religion and fulfilled the prophecies and the expectations of that great historic faith. So the events we recall at this time of the year, his birth, death, and resurrection primarily, are the foundational events of the Christian faith. But we know, and this is the message of Ascension Day and the period between Ascension Day and Pentecost, that the mysterious appearances of the risen Jesus came to an end as they had to. Jesus ascended into heaven, and 10 days later, the first Christian Pentecost, the Christian community was given the Holy Spirit to guide it and strengthen it so it could proclaim God's kingdom. Jesus said, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. This was a classic turning point, a step change for the followers of Jesus when they said farewell reductantly to Jesus on earth and began the process of understanding him in a new and different way as Lord of all, enthroned in heaven. And for we 21st century worshippers, this is the moment in our liturgical year which gives way from tradition towards innovation. If you think about this, we can't underestimate what a shock it must have been for the first early Christians. They thought they had lost Jesus forever, perhaps in part because of their own unfaithfulness. They were therefore overjoyed and transformed to discover that after three days, God had raised Jesus to new life. Then only six weeks or so later, he was to leave them again, this time forever, promising the gift of an intangible spirit to look after them and lead them into deeper truth. I think the idea underlying the ascension of our Lord is a very important idea. It is to recognize that there has to be a final parting 
from the earthly and historical Jesus so that God, through God's Holy Spirit, can come to the world in a new and different way. There had to be a break from the past for there to be a future. We've just experienced the coronation of a new king. The service in Westminster Abbey was also an event which looked both backwards to tradition and forwards to the future. Backwards to more than a thousand years of Christian culture, forward to a monarchy that seeks to model the values of contemporary United Kingdom and Commonwealth in all its diversity seeking to be relevant to persons of faith and no faith. But there are temptations there, not just for King Charles, but for all people of faith and no faith. Many of us want to cling to tradition. In a forever changing world, we hope we can find some security in history. But what we shall soon remember in the worship of Ascension Day and Pentecost is that we must take God's future seriously. As Christians, we need to recognize the presence of God in God's world through God's Holy Spirit that will teach us everything and lead us into all the truth. This is not to throw the baby of tradition out with the bathwater of innovation, but to recognize that the heart of Christianity and the lives of Christians there and the lives of Christians now is a God-given tension between looking backward and looking forward in the life of the Spirit. It's a tension that can't be revealed or resolved easily, either by running back into the past hiding from the present, as it were, or by flitting from innovation to innovation, ignoring our precious heritage. If we look across the Christian economy, we see that different churches and denominations manage this tension in different ways. At one end of the spectrum, there is the slow-moving Greek and Russian Orthodox churches who see little place for development in theology or church life. On the other end of the spectrum, there are Pentecostal and charismatic groups who have little regard for church history, tradition, and theology. You won't be surprised to learn that classical Anglicanism is somewhere in between the two. Not, I suggest, because we are born compromisers, looking for a quiet life. But because Anglicans have believed, have always believed, that a human perception of the truth is more likely to be found in untidy paradoxes than in some neat and tidy system that claims to have worked everything out. One of the greatest archbishops of Canterbury was Dr. Michael Ramsey, who wrote a great book called The Church of England and the Gospel. He said this in it, its credentials are its incompleteness, with tension and travail in its soul. It is clumsy and untidy. It baffles neatness and logic, for it is sent not to commend itself as the best type of Christianity, but by its very brokenness to point to the universal church wherein all have died. Sometimes some of us are drawn towards the simplicity and the security of a life where everyone knows their place and the roles they inhabit are clearly defined. A group following God their way and disregarding the values of the outside world. I suggest we are called to engage with the world because it is God's world it's been made by God. It's a world in which God chose to dwell in his Son and in which he is present today in God's Holy Spirit. 
But we are not called crudely and simply to follow the world. We are called critically to engage with the world because that is the vocation of a contemporary follower of Jesus, guided and strengthened by the Holy Spirit to play our small part, but important part, in transforming God's world into God's kingdom. And so we look on Thursday to Ascension Day and thereafter to Pentecost itself 10 days later. My prayer tonight is that these important celebrations will help us both to value our past and look forward with trust to the work of the Holy Spirit, to God's future for us. In the words of the last verse of our first hymn, Jesus lives, to him the throne over all the world is given. May we go where he is gone, rest and reign with him in heaven. Amen. We now stand to sing our final hymn, Jerusalem the Golden.
from the dead, strengthen you to walk with him in his risen life, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Unacum illi 